our next speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Anthony N. DeMaria, founded the Sulpizio Family Cardiovascular Center at the University of California, San Diego, and his field of specialization is cardiac imaging techniques, particularly echocardiography. Dr. DeMaria is currently the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. He has served as an editorial consultant and member of various other editorial boards. He has also authored or co-authored over 530 articles for medical journals. His topic today, stem cells and biomatrixes. So please, uh, gives us great pleasure to welcome Dr. DeMaria. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I feel like Madonna up here, you know, at the world's biggest microphone. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, w what I've got for you this morning is a little bit of a primer, primer if you like, uh, on on stem cells and biomatrices uh, uh, to to run through it. So if any of you are experts, you may be bored by this. Uh, but let's, uh, let's start off, and, and this whole issue of stem cells, it's so fascinating. You know, it's the, as I look at it, the last major hurdle in cardiology. Um, we, we can stent occluded arteries, we can put in defibrillators, we can change heart valves, but we can't replace heart muscle. And therein lies the magic of regenerative medicine, primarily by cells, but with some interesting things about matrices, biomatrices. So let me just remind you that the characteristics of stem cells are that they're undifferentiated. They're capable of becoming virtually any organ. Second, they have unrestricted uh, uh, capability to reproduce so they can reproduce over and over again. And of course, they've got that pluripotent evolution. So we've got an invisible pointer, so I won't use it. But, but what we're looking for is we're looking for cells that are undifferentiated, can reproduce over and over again, and have the potential to become any kind of organ. You know, it's amazing that there's a number of clinical trials going on with stem cells, and we don't know some of the most basic information about them. Why do they remain undifferentiated? What is it about their nature, genetic or otherwise? Uh, what triggers them to convert into a specific type of tissue when they do? And what are the internal signals that, that lead to this? I think this is going to be, yeah, this is invisible as well. I think it's the screen. No problem. OK, so when we talk about stem cells, uh, how many different kinds of stem cells are there? Well, they're embryonic stem cells from the embryo, of course. And then we have stem cells that we're trying to get from adults to, to use. And the bone marrow is a great source, hematopoietic or mesenchymal. People have tried to use skeletal muscle, the concept being that muscle is muscle, and, and maybe we can take myoblasts, which are capable of reproduction and making them into heart muscles. Cardiomyocytes, there are in every one of us sitting here stem cells in our own heart, islet positive cells that can be extracted, very few in number, but perhaps the, the best potential of all the types of stem cells. And then lastly, induced pluripotent cells, so-called IPS cells, cells that are reprogrammed. So give me a little bit of skin, I'll take the fibroblasts from the skin, put in some new genes, transfect some new genes, and reprogram that skin, uh, that skin cell to become a stem cell. So remember that uh, uh, embryologically, sperms and eggs go to form a blastocyst and then ultimately to a fetus. Well, what embryonic stem cells are at the blastocyst stage, may as well come up here, 
blastocyst stage, the inner cell mass is removed, and they're all stem cells. They're the cells that are ultimately going to be converted into the body so that they are the ultimate stem cell, but problematic in a number of ways, as we'll talk about in a moment. So stem cells come from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst. The advantage is, is that they're absolutely pluripotent. They can become any organ in the body. Um, and they divide forever and ever and ever. So uh, clearly, embryonic stem cells are the best. What are the problems? Well, if you can convert into any organ, you can convert into any tumor. And so embryonic stem cells are tumorogenic. And there's the potential to get tumors and, and cancers. Needless to say, there's uh, a number of ethical issues that have been raised about taking cells from a blastocyst. And lastly, they're non-autologous. That is, you take stem cells from some person and you give them to another so that they're not immunologically protected necessarily. So if we go to adults, we have bone marrow-derived stem cells, either hematopoietic stem cells, the cells that ultimately become RBCs, WBCs, or mesenchymal stem cells, which are bone marrow cells that tend to uh, adhere to plastic and, and can be differentiated from the uh, hematopoietic cells. The mesenchymal cells are the cells that have been used primarily so far, more being done with hematopoietic stem cells. And so these are derived from the bone marrow. The hematopoietic cells normally make blood. The mesenchymal cells have the ability to become a number of tissues. The advantage is of bone marrow-derived cells that they can provide an autologous source. So any one of us can provide bone marrow, and then those cells can be expanded in numbers and re-injected. And in fact, uh, yesterday in a, in a meeting for a new study that's, that's being planned, a, a multi-center study by Baxter, um, in, in patients who have serious heart disease will get some bone marrow. It'll be expanded and then re-injected into the patients. The disadvantage, uh, well, it also avoids ethical issues, and there have been lots of use in clinical trials, disadvantages is that we're not 100% sure. In fact, we're pretty sure the other way around that these cells have difficulty converting into myocytes, cardi cardiomyocytes. And as I'll say in a moment, it would appear that for the bone marrow cells, the major benefit is paracrine. There's something that they emit that's of value. Skeletal myoblasts, I only tell you this to say they haven't worked out. They're very arrhythmogenic. And at this point in time, there's no work going on any longer with skeletal myoblasts. Um, moving on to the cardiac progenitor cells, uh, there are cells in, in the body. We've, we've thought for years, when I went to medical school, we were taught that cardiac cells are terminally differentiated. They're at the end of the line. But in fact, uh, a number of laboratories have been able to derive cells from the cardiac muscle itself that have stem cell characteristics. Um, the most important work done with this so far by Eduardo Marban uh, at Cedars-Sinai. But, but think of this. this. This would be the ultimate, because it's autologous. Somebody goes in and takes a heart biopsy from any one of us. It's immune protected. We're not going to reject our own cells. They're intrinsically programmed to become heart muscle cells. And, and so the regenerative capacity would be enormous. So that, at, at least at the moment, my bias is to think if somehow we could use the intrinsic cardiomyocytes that have stem cell potential, that that would be the best. The problem is there's very, very, very few of them. So they're kind of hard to come by. Right. The IPS cells, of course, attracted the most potential. 
I mean, th this was the biggest ex excitement. The idea that somebody could take some of our cells and genetically reprogram them by putting in a cocktail of, of compounds that would reprogram to an early phase of, uh, of, of life, then these cells would be immune protected and could potentially become cardiomyocytes. Now, uh, that work continues. It's, it's clear this can be done. There, it's difficult to expand these cells. Um, there's some evidence that they're not immune protected. Uh, but, of course, if they're coming from you, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, the last thing is they potentially have some ability to form tumors. So that all of that's really exciting. And the question is, could you take this material and create a whole new heart? And that's Doris Taylor, who sent me an email the other day, who's on her way to Texas, but she was at the University of Minnesota at the time. And what she did was she decellularized a heart, and she took the fibrous tissue stroma. She then took some hematopoietic, some bone marrow stem cells, and she grafted them on and created a beating heart, a contracting heart. Now, you first have to start with the fibrous skeleton, so most of us aren't willing to give up our heart for a while to get a new one. But nevertheless, uh, it created enormous amount of enthusiasm to show that you could reconstruct an organ from stem cell tissue that, in fact, contracted and would pump blood. So, um, you know, there's been this debate that's gone on, uh, an acrimonious debate, if I do say so myself, as to whether the stem cells that we've used so far from adults can actually regenerate new muscle. And uh, the answer, I think, on the most part, is that that's probably not been documented. So that what's happening? Well, you can get transdifferentiation. The stem cells you put in can combine with intrinsic cardiomyocytes and form new cells. Or you can get vasculogenesis, develop new blood vessels. The paracrine effect is, is probably most important. That is to say that these cells can elaborate growth factors or anti-apoptotic proteins or angiogenic proteins. And in fact, there's some evidence that you don't even need the cells themselves, that you can culture the cells withdraw the medium that contains some of these paracrine factors and then inject them and get a benefit. So, so that when we talk about stem cell therapy, it's not necessarily regeneration. There may be some regeneration, transdifferentiation, but a lot of it's paracrine. So just to move quickly, this is, this is a horrendous, horrendous task to regenerate myocardium. You'd have to do each and every one of these steps. You'd have to identify and isolate suitable cells from the ones I've told you about. You've then got to expand the population because the evidence is you need millions, millions of cells to get a benefit. Then you've got to find some way to deliver the cells to exactly where they're needed. They've got to home and engraft they can't be flushed out. They've got to develop gap junctions so that they contract synergistically with the intrinsic myocardium. Got to acquire an adequate vascular supply. Now remember, you may be injecting stem cells into an area of infarct. It infarcted in the first place because there was inadequate uh, perfusion, and now you put stem cells in there. Uh, it's got to overcome ischemia, wall stress, contribute to improved function and reduce symptoms of mortality. So this is a, you know, this is a daunting task. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I was a young cardiologist, I would necessarily say I'm going to devote my life to stem cells. It's a long journey, but there's a big, big carrot on the end of that stick. So quickly, let me tell you just a couple more points. How am I doing for time? Oh, seven minutes. Okay. So the question is how you give these things. 
okay? I mean, what we'd like to do is give them IV, but they get washed out. Um, you can give them intracoronary, but again, uh, they tend not to home and engraft. So that, in fact, most of the studies I've been involved with have used transendocardial injection. So what we do is we put a catheter in the left ventricle and then a needle through the catheter and inject the cells directly into the myocardium. So it's, uh, it's an invasive procedure, but that's the best way to get the most cells in the areas that you want them. And of course, tracking the cells uh, can be a problem. How do you know that the cells have engrafted and that they're active? And we don't have a good way to do that yet. We thought MRI would be to use Feridex imaging. The problem is that the iron stayed, but the cells died, so that we thought we were doing great, but in fact we weren't. So that's another issue. Now, one of the other areas, forget about taking stem cells. This is some work we've done at UC San Diego, Karen Chrisman, who's a tremendously gifted bioengineer. And she makes ground substance out of heart tissue. So she starts with the heart, decelerizes it, freezes it, then she uh, lyophilizes it into powder. And that powder can then be reconstituted, and it forms a matrix. You can inject it through a catheter, and it's essentially creating new ground substance. And the ground substance can be injected around an infarct to stabilize the, the infarction. And again, we have to use this NOGA mapping technique where you go in and electrically identify the uh, myocardium to be targeted and then inject. And what you can see here, this is what normal, normal uh, matrix looks like. This is what transplanted uh, uh, matrix looks like from Karen Chrisman's material so that we've given this to a bunch of rats uh, after infarction and, and to some pigs. Again, injected transendocardially, and uh, we've observed less remodeling after the infarction process. So, uh, you know, that's another way to avoid the issues with stem cells. So there's a, a variety of clinical studies, but my time is almost up, I'll tell you, that the largest study using uh, mesenchymal stem cells was the REPAIR AMI trial, intracoronary bone marrow progenitor cells. There was an, a global increase uh, in ejection fraction of about 3% in REPAIR MI. And uh, if, if you uh, look at event-free survival, you can see that the patients who got the bone marrow cells did better than the patients who didn't. There have been a whole host, whole host of uh, small trials. The biggest was Repair MI. There have been a, a number of trials, 100 patients or less. And this is a meta analysis we published in JAK some time ago. And you can see that if you look at the total overall, there's a net benefit. Uh, in looking at ejection fraction. We also published this analysis. Now, this goes back to 2009. It's a rapidly moving field so, so that there's more data. In fact, just before I came here, I listened to a, a, an abstract presentation uh, 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 of a, a study by the Stem Cell Consortium uh, that's just being published today in JAMA. But in any event, these stem cell studies, and if you do a meta-analysis and you look, the average benefit in ejection fraction in these patients with LB dysfunction with coronary disease, about 3%. So you look at that and you say, man, that's a lot of trouble to go from an ejection fraction, say, of 40 to 43%. I mean, doing all of this to go 40 to 43 percent, why waste your time? Well, it's interesting if you put it into perspective of drugs that are used to treat congestive heart failure. 
because you see you have the save trial, the hard trial, Valiant, Capricorn. In fact, the average benefit of these trials that have uh, been approved by the FDA, the agents that were used, is about 3%. So, so the stem cells are giving about uh, that much uh, uh, benefit. Now, there's a whole host of, of trials that are going on. I can't help but recognize Dr. Marban in the audience, who, as I told you earlier in the game, is uh, far and away in the lead uh, with the cardiomyocytes. And that's my own uh, bias. But there's lots and lots of studies going on. Unfortunately, the study presented this morning was negative. Uh, so that, but there were important insights to come from. Unfortunately, as we get older, our own stem cells uh, are not as vigorous as we need them to be. And uh, th we need better and better ways of isolating the potent stem cells. So, you know, I would say at this point in time, both animal and human data indicate that the injection of autologous stem cells into infarcted or ischemic uh, heart muscle can improve function about 3%. The mechanism is unclear, and uh, it's likely uh, a paracrine effect rather than new cardiomyocytes being regenerated. There is evidence of angiogenesis, and that's useful. And uh, you know, this, this, as I say, in, in my own opinion, is the last major hurdle in cardiology. If we can regrow myocardium, then uh, maybe we can live forever. I'm not sure we want to, but uh, that's possible. Thanks very much for your attention.